The Israelites didn't celebrate because it was convenient or because they were reacting to something great. They celebrated in rhythm. And that rhythm was about remembering God, remembering who He was, remembering the ways He had been faithful to them in the past. You know, many people go through life waiting for that infamous other shoe to drop or believing that if anything can possibly go wrong, it's bound to go wrong. Well, my guest today, Nicole Zasowski, invites us to an entirely different life altogether. She poses the question, but what if it's wonderful? Welcome to the Significant Women Podcast. I'm your host, Carol McLeod. Significant Women is a podcast for women in all seasons, in all stages of life. And we gather around a podcast to share the wisdom gleaned from the ordinary days in living wholeheartedly for Christ and His kingdom. Our goal is to simply encourage women that when you are connected to the heart of the Father, that your story matters. It matters very much. You know, honestly, I wish that I would have written the book that Nicole has just written. She's a mother, an author, and a therapist, and she tackles the subject of joy and celebration. Now, you've got to know that I love that book. Nicole wisely says this, I'm learning to write more exclamation points in my life. I'm finding the courage to celebrate. Because the truth is, sometimes it does take courage to celebrate, doesn't it? Nicole's message is a message that deeply resonates with me. So lean in and listen to my guest today, Nicole Zasowski. Well, as you all know, Nicole is my guest today. And Nicole, um, I said it in my intro, but let me just tell you face to face, yours is the book I wish I would have written. It is an exclamation point of how to live life in a glorious way. So thank you. Thank you for your heart. Um, but before we talk about your book, I want to talk about you. I want to talk about the girl who wrote the book that I love. So sure. like, tell us, like, what do you do? What did you do this morning? Did you make your bed? Did you take the dogs <laughs> for a walk? Like, what, what did you do? Tell us about your life. <laughs> well, first of all, what a kind thing to say. Thank you so much for those kind words. Uh, my husband is traveling. Um, we live in the Northeast, the greater New York area, and he is in Los Angeles. So the opposite country or opposite side of the country, I should say. Um, and yeah, so I did not make my bed. It was, it was, uh, you know, bare minimum this morning, just get everybody out the door on time. Uh, lunch is made. <laughs> I have one in kindergarten and I have a two and a half year old and a 16 month old. Um, so it's, it's just a lot of bodies that need a lot of help and shoes on, you know, teeth brushed, all the, the all the things. So, sister, how did you have time to write a book with like a six-year-old, a two-and-a-half-year-old, a one-year-old? One like, who are you? Are you Wonder Woman? Oh no, far from <laughs> it, far from it. I, you know, I, I look back on this exact time last year. So we're we're heading into summer, and I have the same question. I, it does not make sense <laughs> to me, um, which which tells me it's. Fully, God's God's grace and and His movement uh, with my five loaves and two fishes in terms of gifts and energy. So um, I don't. I will never write anything He doesn't ask me to write. And it's partly because it's hard enough uh, when He does call me. I can't imagine how hard it would be if I didn't have the confidence that He had called me to do this. So. Uh, that's what got me through um, is is assuming that he was with me and and working if he called me to do it. And so I edited the whole thing with my daughter on my chest, who was a newborn. Um, and the editing, I turned it in about a month after she was born, so you can imagine what my first draft looked like. Um, and so the editing process was intense and arduous. <laughs> it always is. It always is. Yeah. So when you were a little girl, did you always want to be an author? No, 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 no. Um, a, a therapist was an early dream of mine. I'm a marriage and family therapist, and I have a practice here in Connecticut and 
get to travel the country sometimes speaking about the intersection of, of faith and psychology. Um, and, and so that was on my heart fairly early on in my life. Um, and I had done more academic writing. I had co-authored some books with my mentor in graduate school around the topic of forgiveness and the therapy model that we use. Uh, but that was the extent of, of my writing dreams. Um, and about a decade ago, I walked into a season that could largely be characterized by change and loss. Um, and it was a season that really held up the mirror to a lot of uh, gifts in my life that were indeed good things, but I was expecting more joy from them than they were meant to give and had placed my value and sense of security in things that uh, promised way more than they could deliver. And so that really um, caused me to journal a lot and reflect and learn for myself all of the things that I knew as a therapist and helped other people with. Um, I, I had to go on my own journey with the, with that truth. And so that is where my first book was born, From Lost to Found. Um, and then my second book, uh, the one that you referred to that came out recently, What If It's Wonderful, is the part two to that story. Mm, mm. Well, let, let's pause and let's talk about change for a minute. You talked about you went through a, a season of transition or change. And, you know, for women, Nicole, I, I think life is especially seasonal. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the little girl season and the college season and the young bride season and the mom season and the empty nest season and, yeah. uh, you know, other choices or assignments that we have. Um, and although we serve the God who never changes— yeah, I think he loves change. Yes. Um, I think he loves to change things. So, what would your advice be to a woman who's going through a season of change right now? How would you mm -hmm. undergird her hope? Mm, what a great question. I'll speak for myself and say that every time I've gone through a major change, it fe and maybe it's just me, but it feels like it's pulled entitlements from my grasp and things I was tempted to cling to for security and value instead of Christ, um, it, pull those things out of my hands. Um, and all those props that we're tempted to lean on um, quickly become just that, props that eventually fall. And so I always have this vision of empty hands. Uh, change gives mm -hmm. me empty hands. But here's the invitation of empty hands. Empty hands are open. They're open to receive God in places that we were tempted to replace him. Um, in this most recent book, I talk about the year of Jubilee. You know, I studied all these feasts and festivals of the Old Testament because it was about celebration. And that was one of the places I looked to really understand celebration biblically. And the year of Jubilee was just fascinating to me because it sounds at the, the title of it sounds like it's this joyous festival that's really elaborate and, you know, maybe even gluttonous in some ways. Like it's, we just picture this huge feast and what it was in fact is it happened every 50 years, all slaves were freed, all property was returned to the original owner. Um, it, it was it was a celebration of release, um, a celebration of empty, empty hands. And it was celebrating receiving God in places that the Israelites were tempted to replace him. And I just think about that with change. Um, there's always an opportunity to cling to a God who doesn't change when our life feels all out of sorts. Yeah, I, I love that, Nicole. Um, uh, that that is so powerful, and and for me, one of the purposes of change, as you pointed out, is so that we run to Him and not to our things, not to our yeah. stuff, not to our season. I remember Nicole when my second son was going off to college, a season of life you haven't experienced yet, but it no. is <laughs> a great challenge. Yes, and I heard his feet come down our stairs 
in a particular rhythm. You know how each child mm-hmm. has a particular rhythm. Yeah. And I heard his rhythm, ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum And my heart was breaking. He was leaving me tomorrow. Mm. And the Lord spoke to me through Isaiah chapter 33, and it says, For the Lord will be the stability of your times. Mm. And, and for women, our children are not our stability. Our marriage is not our stability. Right. The Lord is our stability. Mm-hmm. So I love the insight you have into that. But let's let's talk about your new book because I want to spend most of the interview <laughs> talking about your new book. What if it's wonderful? So yes. why did you write this book? What spurred you on mm. to say this is my next book? Mm. Well, uh, the the move to the East Coast kicked off a season that could largely be characterized by change and loss for me. Uh, my husband and I walked through five miscarriages in so many years and discovered a diagnosis that um, means that when I get pregnant, that's the more likely scenario is is losing that baby to miscarriage, st- statistically speaking. Um, and just a lot of learning and growing that felt really painful in that season. And You know, when we go through a season of loss, whether it's a tangible loss or a betrayal or just a season that is turning out really differently than you hoped it would, there's the loss, there's what happened, and then there's the cost. And the cost is the impact to our sense of identity and or our sense of security. And what took me a really long time to realize is that part of the cost of that season for me is when I did start experiencing some good news and breakthrough in our story, my joy was accompanied by a lot of fear. It felt easier not to hold the gift than to hold something that might break. And I tried to protect myself by always preparing for the worst case scenario, waiting for the other shoe to drop, rehearsing disaster, practicing disappointment. And I was so grieved uh, when I realized that, yeah, I've, I've experienced some tangible loss, but a lot of the loss I've experienced has been my refusal to fully engage the, the joy that's right in front of me. And I thought, I don't want to miss out on my beautiful God-given life because I am so busy preparing for the worst. And that sent me into scripture and neuroscience research to really understand God's design for celebration and joy. Mm, Love it. Hey, sister, did you know that's my story too? Mm. Five children on earth and five children in heaven. Really? Yeah, I'd get to between... 12 and 20 weeks in the pregnancies when the babies would die inside of me. So four of them I held in my hand. Wow. Wow. Oh, wow. And and I believe for every season of suffering, there is um, spoil that the Mm. Lord gives us on the other side. Mm. And for me, it's been the gift of joy that, that I was getting. And I can tell that that's part of the gift that you've been given as well. Yes. Hey, I want to read one of the quotes from your book, okay, sure. Nicole, and then I want you to comment on it. The rhythm of our daily walks on the beach, hunting for colors in the sand, is our family's stake in the ground, that we are here to notice and celebrate beauty and experience joy in this season. Celebration is our protest. What began as a means of entertaining my boys during months characterized by cancellations and closures has become our everyday practice of noticing, appreciating, and savoring the goodness, our practice of celebration. Okay, celebration is our protest. Yes. What comment on that, Nicole? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like so many of us, originally, I was living like celebration was either a reward for an accomplishment or a reaction to good news. And I always saw my joy sitting on the other side of a dream realized or a goal achieved or some sort of change in my circumstances. And when I discovered in scripture and the neuroscience research and in my own, the living of my own story, 
what I discovered is that celebration is, yeah, sometimes a reaction or a reward, but most of the time it's actually a rhythm. It's a rhythm that we practice that's available to all of us, regardless of what kind of season we're walking right now. Um, and it's it's a rhythm that helps us cultivate more joy in the life that we're already living. And I have to admit, at first I was a little bit annoyed when (laughs) I learned that celebration was a discipline. I thought, my goodness, can't this just be the thing that comes to us easily? And then I realized what a gift and how freeing it was that God designed it that way to be in rhythm regardless of what's going on in our lives. And not that we are toxically positive. We're not expecting joy to cancel what is painful and hard, Um, but that there is this rhythm available to us that helps us engage our current life and extract more joy and connection and meaning from it along the way. You know, Nicole, I have always loved the two-word phrase, choose joy. Uh-huh. But I just, I just read an article where some people are reacting against it. Yes. Can, can you comment on that? Is it possible to choose joy? I think it depends on the way that you are approaching that phrase. I think the reaction comes from people who've been really hurt by that toxic positivity where we haven't sat with each other in the mud pit. We haven't sat with each other in the depths of our grief. And if we want to move someone forward in their journey, um, it's best to start by sitting with them where they are. And so this idea of choosing joy, I think, can be invalidating for some people. That is not the way I mean it. (laughs) What I mean is, yeah, we fully acknowledge that this world is not as it should be, that the world inside our home is sometimes not as it should be, and there's real pain there. Um, But to acknowledge that what is dark today is also not going to be dark forever. Uh, When If you've put your trust in Jesus, there's promises that are real and true about what our inheritance is um, and that the end of the story is ultimately joy. And so that choosing joy is is not an invalidation of pain, um, but, but a practice that connects me with a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, when I, I mentioned those Old Testament feasts and festivals, um, they were, the, the Israelites didn't, celebrate because it was convenient or because they were reacting to something great. They celebrated in rhythm. And that rhythm was about remembering God, remembering who He was, Mm -hmm. remembering the ways He had been faithful to them in the past. And that's a practice that is available to all of us, even in our painful seasons. And so that is what I mean by choose joy. Yeah, I just love that. And I love the word remember that you pointed Mm -hmm. out to us. Because to me, I've struggled with depression in my life, Nicole. But to me, when I remember the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God, the fingerprint of God upon other seasons in my life, it helps to point my heart in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So I, I love what you have said about remember. Um, one time I did a Bible study on the words forget and remember in the Bible because they're, huh. they're both there. They're both there. Yeah. And what I learned basically in a nutshell, in a generalized nutshell, is that we're supposed to forget our stuff and remember God's stuff, huh. you know, to remember what He has done in our mm-hmm. lives. Wow. So thank you for that reminder. Um, of course. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to read you another quote from your book. Are you ready? Okay. Okay. Yes. okay. Okay. You said, I'm learning to write more exclamation points in my life. I'm finding the courage to celebrate. There are times when it feels natural and automatic response. Other times, it feels uncomfortable. But in my experience, to practice celebration, you don't need it to come naturally. So I'm learning to write more exclamation points in my life. How do you do that? How do you do it in a practical sense? Mm. 
I think for me, um, you know, when people picture celebration, they tend to picture a party. Mm -hmm. And I am so Mm -hmm. grateful for the party planners and uh, people who are gifted in hospitality in my life. (laughs) I I am not (laughs) one of them. Um, My celebration uh, tends to be these everyday practices that help me to write exclamation points in my days. Um, doable, simple, uh, accessible practices that can be incorporated into my everyday routine. Um, And this is important because of what's going on in the brain naturally. Left on neutral, our brains lean negative. And so all we have to do to feel disappointment or despair is nothing. Um, and, and so these practices are particularly helpful in retraining our brain and, and carving new neural pathways uh, to write exclamation points in our life and, and see the goodness that God is weaving through our days and to really absorb the fullness of that experience. And I'd love to talk about my favorite way of doing this. Yes, do it, do it. Um, so this is, the, this is a practice called savoring. Okay. And what savoring does is it celebrates the ordinary. And the reason this is so significant, I mentioned how the brain leans negative. Um, but part of that is your brain is very efficient. It only picks up what it thinks it's going to need, which unfortunately is large and painful things. Um, painful information is just stickier in our brains than mm-hmm. those moments of delight. And so mm-hmm. what this means practically is that all those moments of noticing beauty in nature or connecting deeply with our loved ones or a funny conversation we have with one of our kids or whatever it is um, are not things your brain thinks are important. And mm-hmm. so savoring is a way of training your brain to see those things as important. And the way that you do this is you just take a snapshot from your day. So sometimes I'll I'll even say like click or, you know, like I'm taking a picture in my head. Um, And I love to practice this in the moment. Some people like to practice it as a reflective exercise at the end of their day. Whatever works for you and, and whatever you find meaningful. But you take that one simple picture and I mean small. I had a friend who chose just the fact that her, her husband, and her four teenagers were sitting down around the same table at the same time for dinner. <laughs> and I'm sure the food wasn't perfect, and there were probably squabbles at the dinner table. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just one small moment, the fact that they were all sitting at the same time. And you just ask your five traditional senses what they're going to remember about that moment. Mm. So what do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? What do you taste? And what do you feel? And that celebrates that ordinary moment in a way that your brain will hang on to it, carry it forward, and can recall it later. Um, And over time, if you do this daily or multiple times a day, your brain will start to see those things more naturally. You, you know, it's that old mm-hmm. adage, we find what we look for. Mm-hmm. Um, and so all of the sudden, noticing these moments um, and opportunities to savor will feel more plentiful because your brain has been trained to look for them. Wow, I love that. Nicole, you are putting words, you are putting language to the lifestyle that I have always loved mm-hmm. to um, find joy in the little things in life, in the simple things in life. Um, because it's the simple things that build a grand life. It's not the red letter days yeah. um, that, that build a, a substantial life, mm-hmm. but it's a mountain. It's, it's a, a mountain of the simple pleasures of life. You know, we've got it all wrong in our culture. We think being on the front of People magazine or writing the best-selling book for our generation or, you know, whatever your if is, is what builds a great life. But it's not. It's having four teenagers around the dinner table. That's grand. 
That's grand. Yeah. And I think, you know, so I was at this worship concert um, the other night. And if you've ever worshiped in a stadium, it was in a, a basketball arena in, in Boston. So just the the musicians were amazing, but just the experience of worshiping with that many people was such a thin place. Um, and this girl in front of me, bless her heart, <laughs> was <laughs> recording every single song. I just watched her watch the whole concert through her, you know, however big our, our cell phones are, her three by five cell phone and watch that recording circle. And I thought, goodness, in in the age of technology, we are trying to capture everything and we are savoring nothing. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're not living in our shoes and, and really savoring that experience. Um, we're just so busy trying to capture everything that we can't keep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I don't know, Nicole, I think that's a good reminder for young moms that you know you're allowed to take five pictures a day and then put your phone down yeah and love the life you've been given yes. love these days yeah, yeah that's mm-hmm. a good word for me <laughs> <laughs> okay let's just admit it right now nicole is my kindred spirit She's such an amazing woman. I wish that I could sit with her for hours and hours and go digging for gold in her soul. We'll get right back to my conversation with Nicole Zasowski and her new book, But What If It's Wonderful? But I just wanted to take a minute and share with you a few things that are going on in Carol McLeod Ministries. First of all, did you know that we have an app for the ministry? That's right, we do. This is the way you access it. You just take your smartphone, Um, Whether it's an Android or an iPhone, you just take it, go to the App Store and search for Carol McLeod Ministries. You can download this app for free and then have so much fun utilizing all of its features. You can listen to a podcast, you can read a blog post, you can leave a comment, you can share with us a prayer request, or even do some shopping. It's just a wonderful, effective way to stay in touch and access all of our ministry resources. Also, I'd like to invite you to buy a copy of my newest book, At Home in Your Heart. It's a 60-day devotional that was written to invite you into a deeper, more intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. At Home in Your Heart is available on Amazon, christianbook.com, shoptheword.com, or at our website, which is carolmcleodministries.com. It'll make a great gift for all of the women in your life. And now, get ready to celebrate again as we rejoin my conversation with Nicole Zasowski. So, Nicole, tell me the difference between celebration and escape. Hmm. Yeah, sometimes celebration can get misbranded or we think that it's unhealthy or unhelpful, um, like as a way of disengaging with the reality of our life. And um, certainly a better question than looking at the behavior itself. Sometimes people say, "Well, well, tell me what celebration is from a behavioral standpoint and tell me what escapism is. And a better question to ask ourselves is actually, what am I looking for? Um, in engaging in this behavior. Because if I'm a fly on the wall watching you uh, engage in some activity, with the exception of a few obvious examples, I may not be able to tell whether you're celebrating or, or trying to escape. So escapism is a reaction to pain that mm. actually disconnects us from our emotional experience and our relationship with God and other people. Celebration is actually a, an action, a healthy action based on truth that connects us more deeply with our emotional experience and our relationship with God and other people. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so the drive is different, even if the behavior might look the same. So, Nicole, what would you say to a woman who's really in the depths of pain today? Her, mm-hmm. her world has imploded, whether it's a, a prodigal child or a, a, a betrayal by her husband, um, 
a health diagnosis, how does this message, how does this rhythm of celebration help her live in a healthy manner today? Mm. Yeah, what does celebration look like when we can't rejoice? Um, yes. Shortly after the book came out, I confronted this in a in a new way when our community experienced a tragedy. Um, the a young man died in a car accident, and it was it just really rocked our world. And uh, it's been a hard season, I'll be honest, in our community since the book released. A lot of tragedy. Um, And this is a question I've returned to often because I believe in celebration. I believe in everything that I wrote in that book. And yet it has not, in many ways, um, felt like a particularly celebratory season in the ways that we tend to think. And I noticed shortly after this tragedy, um, when it happened, the day it happened, it was an awful day in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. I mean rain going sideways, pelting down all day long, freezing winds. I mean, it was awful. And all I wanted to do was go to the beach and pick up sea glass. Um, And as you know, because you've read the book, but for those listening who haven't, that's become my rhythm um, and our family's rhythm, a way that we have woven community and laughter and reminded ourselves of God's faithfulness. Uh, And it started at the beginning of the pandemic, and it's continued as our our family's favorite pastime. And that's all I wanted to do on that day. Uh, And there's nothing in the weather forecast that would have explained why that's what I wanted to do. And then I, I thought that was so interesting, and I realized, oh, that's my way of remembering Um, when I wish that life would change and it isn't, or when I, Mm -hmm. um, when life has suddenly changed in a way that I don't want it to, Mm -hmm. um, I am remembering a God who doesn't change Mm -hmm. and I'm not diminishing the celebration we get to have when we see breakthrough and we see victory and there is a change in our circumstances. I think that's beautiful. We should celebrate that. But often it's about remembering a God that doesn't change and um, celebrating that He is and always has been and always will be. Yes, yes. Okay, one more quote before we close the interview. Okay, one more quote. Go for it. Okay, you said, few among us simply drift toward joy. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Human nature, right? Human nature, and uh, there's so. I, I was shocked how many different phenomenons are going on in our brain that make that the case. I already talked about one of them, the stickiness with pain. Right, right. Um, there's another one called the hedonic treadmill, which means our brain rapidly adapts to joy. So maybe oh, wow. you receive that good news that you thought would make you want for nothing else, or you receive that gift. And it's wonderful, and there's that moment of thrill, and then your brain quickly adapts to that joy. Um, That's a neurological phenomenon in your brain um, that creates that kind of dissatisfaction in addition to, you know, emotional and spiritual dynamics going on as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And the, the third thing I found so interesting is we have this awful habit as human beings of telling our joy how it can be improved upon. Um, so say you go on that family vacation and it's an awesome time together. You laugh, you create memories, uh, you have some good conversations and you arrive home and you think, oh, I talked about that with my kid, but I didn't talk about this with my kid or yeah, those were some really, really good laughs we had, but we also got into that fight on that one day. You know, we tell Mm -hmm. our joy what would have made it better, Mm -hmm. Um, And these are just a few of the dynamics going on in the brain that left on neutral, your brain is not going to drift toward joy. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's Mm -hmm. it's not going to drift toward remembering what is true. The brain goes where it knows, and it is most comfortable drifting into that um, negative and hopeless uh, line of thinking unless 
we train it differently. And I talked about savoring. If you if you like that part of the conversation and you want some more practical exercises and ways of incorporating celebration into your everyday life, that last third of the book, um, Finding the Courage to Celebrate, will be particularly helpful to you. Great. Great. So we'll have all this in the show notes, but just tell us, Nicole, how can my listeners connect with you? Where can they get a copy of your book? What if it's wonderful? Yes, I would love to hear from listeners and readers. Um, and you can find me on my website, which is just Nicole Zazowski, Z-A-S-O-W-S-K-I.com. You can buy the book, What If It's Wonderful, anywhere you like to buy books. Certainly it's on Amazon. Your local bookstore can order it for you if they don't have it. Um, And then I have all sorts of free goodies on my website that accompany the book, um, including fun, uh, printable, beautifully designed table topics uh, for your own celebrations at home, questions to facilitate good conversation with your loved ones, Mm -hmm. and um, a guided journal to work through your own what-if questions toward asking yourself, what if it's wonderful? So all of that is on my website. Oh, I can't wait. I'm going to go as soon as we're done and look at some of it. But now I've got two um, more questions that I love to do with all of my guests, Nicole. So because the name of the podcast is Significant Women, What other women have significantly impacted your life? Oh, I had the gift of being raised by a really wonderful mother. Um, Mm. And and I say that not, she would be the first to tell you she was not perfect in that role, uh, although she was really, really great. But one of the things that I'm just so grateful for is she gave me everything she didn't have herself meaning she didn't grow up with um, feeling, you know, in a home where she felt valued and safe and through God's grace in a relationship with the Lord was able to give me, empty her pockets and give me all the stuff that she didn't have the gift of being given. And so I could just cry talking about the miracle of that and the hard work that went into that journey for her. Um, I talk a little bit about Elizabeth uh, the biblical character, um, the mom of John the Baptist in in my book. But on this topic, um, being being someone who has an expectant heart and readily receives God's good gifts, she is my model. <laughs> and I love the contrast of of the way that she does that with when the angel visits her and says, you're going to be a mom after all those years of infertility. She just readily receives that news and and is so excited and celebrates freely. And Zechariah, who also walked closely with the Lord, uh, wasn't able to do that. He trusted God as his comforter, but but not necessarily as his celebrator. And uh, yet he still receives the gift, but um, I'm probably more like Zechariah (laughs) at the beginning of this journey. And I'm, I'm working toward, I'm on a journey toward becoming more like Elizabeth. So... Those, those are the answers that came to mind when you asked. Oh, I love that. I've always loved Elizabeth, too. I, Nicole, I've tried to picture her while she was in the waiting for the decades and decades. Like, was she um, crafting little baby diapers? Yeah. Um, what did she give her gifts who were having babies? And then her, her friends were having grandbabies mm-hmm. and then maybe great-grandbabies. And yet yeah. still Elizabeth believed God. God yeah. in all those years. I love yeah. Elizabeth. Thank you for talking about her. Yeah. Okay, last question, I promise. No, nope, um, you're good. This is called My Favorite Things. Okay. okay, this is called A Few of My Favorite Things. Some people would call it a lightning round, but because my favorite movie is The Sound of Music, you know where I have to go, My Favorite Things. Yes. So I'm just going to throw some things at you, Nicole, and oh, you have fine. to tell me what your favorite is. Okay. Great. And if you don't, if there's something you can't think of, we'll just pass and go to the next one. Okay. Other than the Bible, your favorite book? Oof. Oh, so many. It depends on the category. Um, I love historical fiction, and The Paris Architect uh, mm. was a great book. Yeah, mm. I'll go with that. Have you read anything by Brock and Bodie Taney? Oh, no, I don't think so. But that yeah. sounds oh. great. Yes, you would love their books. Brock so and well Bodie researched. Taney. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. What is the worship song that just when you hear the first few notes, your heart starts to race and your hands go in the air and you you just can't hold back the worship? What is that song? Fall Afresh by Bethel, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, And On Repeat by Hillsong United. Okay. Very good. Um, The favorite movie you've ever seen? Oh, man. Right. Um, I think Father of the Bride. Oh, yes. I love that movie. Yes. Yes. Favorite way to rejuvenate? Taking a bath or taking a walk. Picking up glass on the beach. Yep. (laughs) All my walks (laughs) include sea glass. (laughs) Favorite dessert? Key lime pie. Mm, Favorite holiday? Christmas. Yeah, me too. Favorite vacation spot? Sun Valley, Idaho. Mm. Okay, this is going to be a harder one. Favorite gift you've ever been given? Oh, my goodness. That is a hard one. Okay, give me a second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, in this way, I I think it's my favorite gift. When I was first, when God put my first book on my heart, uh, my husband got me a writing class. Um, Mm. and, And it wasn't necessarily the class, but just the... The message in that gift of I believe in you and I want to further this yes. dream and I'm here with you, um, that was really special. I love it. Yeah. Uh, um, do you have a favorite scripture verse that just sort of you cling to? It's your anchor? Mm, I have a few. Mm-hmm. Um, in this last season... Uh, Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is your strength and just delighting in who he is being the thing that's going to sustain me. Um, mm-hmm. That has come to mind a lot, although I think it is probably different in different seasons. Uh, also, the the passage where Paul talks about the thorn in his flesh, and I love the honesty of him begging God to remove it. And, and also realizing, and yet that's the thing that kept him tethered to the hope of Christ. Yes, yes. It's, it's the hard stuff in life mm-hmm. that yes. has the potential to become the great moments yes. in our life. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, before we go, would you feel free to pray for the listeners today? Oh, Nicole? I'd love to. Okay, let's pray. I'd love to. God, like David who danced exuberantly. Um, I pray that we would rejoice and celebrate because we have been a recipient of your grace. I pray that we would know that none of us are disqualified from your celebration, that you delight in us, that we are your beloved, that you celebrate who we are as your creation. And God, from receiving your celebration of us, I pray that we would celebrate one another in our communities by furthering dreams, by um, making someone feel seen and known and loved for exactly who they are, that in doing, by receiving your celebration of us, that we would uh, be countercultural and celebrate one another and create a culture of celebration. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Nicole. I have loved talking to you. Oh, same. Thank you for having me. This has been such a joy. Of course. Okay, I have decided that in the future, whenever I'm tempted to worry or complain, I am going to take Nicole's advice and just ask myself the question, but Carol, what if it's wonderful? I do hope that you will treat yourself to a copy of Nicole's book and even share it with a friend who needs some encouragement. I think that this book is going to be especially vital for moms. But what if it's wonderful? 
Thank you for joining me this week on the Significant Women Podcast. I hope that you'll share this episode with your friends. You can do it on social media or through email, however you choose to do it. And then if you wouldn't mind leaving a review on one of our platforms, just a few words of encouragement is really game changing for us. Thank you so much. My friend, I want you to remember on good days and on hard days, in easy times and in the challenging times of life, because there are challenging times, that you're significant, not because of your life or your achievement or your accomplishments, but you are significant because you have been made in the image of your creator, God. He has stamped you with his power and with his creativity. He has given you his mind and his heart. My friend, don't ever doubt it. You are significant.